Climbers on the slopes of Washington's Mount Rainier caught video of one of the biggest avalanches ever recorded. It was cold, unpredictable, and worst of all, deadly. Witnesses say the ground shook as this happened as the mix of rock and ice roared thousands of feet. On Sunday morning, June 21st, 1981, a group of 23 novice mountain climbers led by six professional mountaineering guides departed Paradise Inn at 5,400 feet on Mount Rainier. They had just completed a demanding one-day course in basic mountaineering climbing skills, and they were heading to Camp Muir to spend the night. Mountaineering is often considered an extreme sport with many cases ending in tragedy. With that being said, Mount Rainier is not considered a dangerous mountain, but that does not mean it doesn't come without its risks. Approximately 7% of mountaineering deaths in the United States are attributed to the peak, with most dangers coming from ice fall or avalanches. And on the morning of June 21st, what the many people on Mount Rainier did not know was that high above them on a known landmark called the Disappointment Cleaver, the Ingram Glacier fractured, leading to one of the most deadly mountaineering disasters in North American history. This is the story of the 1981 Mount Rainier avalanche. Mount Rainier's summit is at an elevation level of 14,411 feet and stands at the tallest mountain in the U.S. state of Washington. The peak is located in Mount Rainier National Park, about 59 miles southeast of Seattle. On clear days, the mountain can be seen as far away as Oregon. 26 glaciers make up its surface, with the mountain being the most heavily glaciated peak in the contiguous United States. The summit is actually made up of two volcanic craters, each over 1,000 feet in diameter. The geothermal heat keeps the crater's rim free of ice and snow, providing a unique summit experience for all climbers. Tim O'Brien was not your average teenager. The 19-year-old Mount Rainier guide loved the mountains more than anything. Born and raised in Oregon, his free time was spent obsessing over climbing, and by the time he was 18, Tim was a sufficient mountaineer. He was well versed in ice climbing, self and team rest techniques, pressure breathing to maximize oxygen intake at high altitudes, and even knew how to rest stop an advanced climbing technique to force the weight of your body on your bones in order to rest your muscles. Due to his unique skills, Tim would be asked and eventually hired as a guide for Mount Rainier. On the morning of June 19, 1981, Tim, along with five other guides, would be hosting a physically demanding one-day basic mountaineering training course in preparation for their summit climb in two days. The training consisted of over 23 inexperienced climbers, varying from ages of 18 to 45. Tim, along with his fellow guides, spent the day becoming familiar with the expedition members as they got to know one another. They hiked their way through Mount Rainier National Park with many inclined and declines. This gave the guides a good perspective on the level of athletic condition each climber had and if they would be set up for the task of summoning a 14,000-foot volcano. While they hiked, the guides would occasionally stop the group and explain a technique or tool that could be demonstrated on the proper environment. The group responded well to each guide as they went about their day with no issues. Tim noticed that everyone seemed to be paying attention and were being very cautious of their surroundings. He thought to himself that he was lucky. This group was proving to be better than the last. They continued trekking through the thin snow and melting ice for hours, until each guide was satisfied and confident in each expedition member's ability. The inexperienced mountaineers did not know at the time, but this was their first major test. If any climber showed signs of weakness and ability to breathe, or just not up to the physical standard required, 
and their guide is the last line of defense before they enter a situation where they could not come back from. On Saturday morning, June 20th, 1981, all 29 members of the expedition were well rested from the night before. They had stayed at Paradise Inn, which is a well-known tavern located in Mount Rainier National Park that boasts a getaway from modern world distractions. In fact, the Mount Rainier Guidehouse is located above Paradise Inn, making it a popular destination before going out on the mountain. Some climbers had breakfast together while others kept to themselves, but when it was time, all of the climbing guides gathered the 23 novice mountaineers together and went over their plan. The route was discussed and walked through. The dangers when climbing and what to look out for were discussed. And finally, the meeting ended with the stereotypical phrase of have fun. When they were all ready, the inexperienced mountain climbers, accompanied by their guides, departed Paradise Inn. The group was led by senior guide John Day. Now the other five guides still played a pivotal role in the group's success as they were tasked with looking after specific individuals. But John's word would be the final say, and if he said turn around, they would all listen. Their destination for today was to reach Camp Muir, which is located a little over 10,000 feet in elevation. Camp Muir is a climber's camp with an impressive stone shelter, a couple of outbuildings, and toilets. Climbers usually hike to Camp Muir the day before they attempt the summit in order to rest and acclimate to the altitude. Most people actually don't consider the route up to Camp Muir a hike. It is more so a mix of hiking and climbing. The group had to walk 2.3 miles before their true route began at Pebble Creek. This is typically a good place to stop, put on sunscreen, throw on a hat, and make sure your shoes are tied. Hikers that make it to this point are rewarded with a scenic view of Mount Rainier. After leaving Pebble Creek, the group started encountering rocky outcroppings and the snow patches became larger and larger. Before long, snow covered the entire route. The weather, as predicted, held up well. The group took many breaks throughout the day to rest their legs, get a bite to eat, and to stay hydrated. After a few hours, they were on the last 500 feet of the climb which is the steepest and most difficult section. Specifically in this area, one must look out for hidden crevasses as they play a part in the path one takes. But the group handled it well and proceeded without issues. There was no time to celebrate upon reaching Camp Muir. Each climber was instructed to eat and sleep as they had a very early day ahead of them. At approximately 3.30 a.m., well before the sun would rise, the group started to wake up. John, Tim, and the rest of the guides checked on each climber before giving instructions on how they wanted the group to prepare. Although it was early, everybody was awake and alert. There was a buzz in the air. The guides knew it, and the climbers felt it. This is what they came here to do. It was summit day. The expedition planned to follow the standard route up Mount Rainier, otherwise called the Disappointment Cleaver Route. This path up to the summit is the only maintained and marked route by guide services, which will assist John, Tim, and the other guides in leading the group of inexperienced climbers up the peak. One of the most common risks for novice mountaineers is simply getting lost. By taking the standard route, the team mitigates this risk. Despite the excitement, John took a few minutes to calm everyone down, set their expectations in line with the day ahead, and instructed everyone to eat something before they move. On average, the climb takes about six to eight hours from Camp Muir to Mount Rainier Summit. John could clearly see the stars in the dark morning sky. There were no clouds that obstructed his view, and the weather predictions done earlier in the week indicated clear skies. John would smile at the other guides and remark how the weather was excellent for a climb. The temperature was hovering right above 30 degrees Fahrenheit, or negative 1 degrees Celsius, so it was cold, but nothing too worrisome. After confirming the entire party was ready, John instructed them to break up into six different groups, with one guide leading each. 
There were about five individuals in each group, and they would be roped together in order to prevent individuals from wandering off or falling down a crevasse. At 3.50 a.m., they set off from Camp Muir. They crossed the Cowlitz Glacier and made their way to the top of Cathedral Gap. John let the group know they should be on high alert, as this area is known for large rock falls and avalanches. The guides were meticulous with their rope placement while climbing because a hard pull could result in stray debris falling under them. After everyone successfully made the traverse, the terrain's steepness drastically increased. The marked path now turned to the west, the direct direction towards the summit. Many climbers were holding up well to this point, although there were one or two individuals already showing signs of fatigue. The group continued to climb and made their way up the inclined slope for about 500 feet where they reached Ingram Flats camp on the Ingram Glacier. John began instructing the group to take a break and get off their legs. Some climbers began resulting, some climbers began rustling in their packs looking for a snack while others took a sip from their canteens. Ingram Flats is a well-known camping site and a popular resting destination. For those attempting the summit, there is limited space and most expeditions don't actually camp here, but occasionally individuals will to make their summit bid easier. A few minutes went by and John noticed some of the climbers talking together and gathering. John would walk over to their location to better hear what they were discussing, and three novice climbers decided they were too tired to continue. Hearing this, John asked out of all the guides who was willing to lead the three individuals back down the mountain to Camp Muir. Chris Lynch, a 23-year-old guide, volunteered. John would help them get organized and make sure they were comfortable before letting Chris take over. John refocused his attention on the remaining 25 climbers and reorganized the groups into five rope teams. Individuals began repacking their bags and standing on their feet. It was time to move again. The rising sun illuminated the horizon, providing more natural light and revealing hidden crevasses in the distance that were previously hidden in the night. After leaving Ingram Flats camp, they made their way to the base of the disappointment cleaver. John did not like the look of the loose snow above him, so the group paused while they evaluated the integrity of the snow. John, along with two other guides, Whitaker and Target, who were both knowledgeable about avalanches, unhooked themselves from the groups and proceeded to walk towards the nose, a small rocky section. Here they dug snow pits, where they shovel stacked layers of deep snow to learn how compact and stable it was. Tim and the others patiently waited to hear the news as they watched the men huddle together. John eventually turned around to face the group with his mind made up. The snow was too unstable to continue and there was no clear path above them. John determined for the safety of the group it was best to turn around and now he took a step towards the group and was about to speak when a large crack was heard. Approximately 800 feet above them, a very large serac at the top of Disappointment Cleaver broke off and toppled over. Several massive ice blocks crashed rapidly down the slope, creating an unusually large snow and ice avalanche. John watched as a 300-foot wall of ice tumbled towards them. Larry St. Peter, a novice mountaineer in the group, later remarked that he vividly remembered everyone pausing like it was a fireworks show and going ooh. Dennis Robertson, another climber, also commented how the majority of the group just stood still. That's when they all heard John yell, run. To their credit, many of them did try to run, but when that much ice and snow is coming your way, there is only so much one can do. Most of them were unable to make it out of the path and were swept off their feet. It all happened in a matter of seconds, and then silence. The cloud of snow and ice dissipated. John was one of the few people untouched and made a quick observation of his surroundings. Within minutes, he spotted 11 climbers. 
and all of his guides, except for Tim. He directed them to a safer location out of the snow's path. A lookout was chosen by John to watch for any more debris that may fall, and the others were instructed to begin looking for missing climbers. John took this opportunity to call into Camp Muir and let them know of the situation. They quickly organized help, but they would be hours away. John went to help the surviving climbers look for their missing comrades. Occasionally, a pair of glasses would be found or other personal belongings but they did not find any of the missing climbers. The group found out that some of the avalanche path ended in a crevasse, and after searching for 30 minutes, John called it off, claiming that the situation was hopeless. It was assumed the missing climbers had either been swept into the crevasses or buried under abundance of snow. With little to do, John instructed two of the surviving guides to take all of the remaining clients back to Camp Muir. However, one of the clients volunteered to stay and help out with whatever was needed. John, his fellow guide Target, and a group of independent climbers stayed and waited. Two and a half hours passed painfully slow. There was nothing the group could do and the mood was so negative nobody wanted to speak. At approximately 9 a.m., Olsen, a park ranger, accompanied by other climbers, arrived at the scene to help. However, the weather had turned for the worse. Visibility became obscure with heavy snowfall. The team would search for 45 minutes until they found a backpack, ice axe, and headlamp. With increasingly poor conditions, the search was called off, not wanting to risk the lives of rescuers. By 11 a.m., the survivors had made it back to Camp Muir. The route on the mountain would be shut down one hour later. The next morning, three separate rescue teams were constructed each with multiple park rangers, volunteers, and mountain rescue members. They left Camp Muir at various times, but all within a couple hours of each other. The teams would spend most of the day digging above and below the crevasses looking for any signs of life. It was hard work, and the added pressure only contributed to the seriousness. By the afternoon, the weather worsened again, preventing more searches to be held. Forty hours after the incident, the search and rescue was called off. Experts cited that it was too dangerous for search personnel to be on the mountain under the current conditions. And the fact that the avalanche was so brutal, it is extremely unlikely anyone could have survived if they were swept off their feet. By noon the next day, news articles and mountaineer officials would call it the worst mountaineering disaster in the United States history. It was impossible for the group to predict what would happen, and there was no one at fault. They had guides, took the necessary precautions, and were all careful. But that's the thing about mountaineering. Sometimes there are unpredictable factors outside one's control. And in 2018, we quite literally saw history repeated itself. The Ingram Glacier collapsed on the exact same landmark in 1981. Disappointment Cleaver, a massive avalanche followed that experts claimed was an unsurvivable event. Luckily, there was nobody in the path of the falling snow, but the pictures will send shivers down your spine. Thank you all for watching. Until next time. And to those who lost their life in 1981, may you rest in peace.